to introduce our sp tonight tonight's speaker, and uh, his name is Peter Benoit. He comes from the Glen Falls chapter. He's been a member of the Adirondack Club since 1984, and currently he is serving on the board. He's the chair, the Human Resources Chair. After a long career in human resources, he's retired now and traveling the world. Anyway, tonight he's going to speak to us about the land of ice bears. Please welcome Peter Benoit. And we... Pardon me? Yeah, Peter's been wrestling polar bears. He's got a broken foot, but he did drive himself down here from Glens Falls today, and he is going to uh, give his presentation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jill. And, th and thanks to the chapter for the invitation to, to speak here tonight. My adventure uh, began in May of 2018 when I joined the National Geographic Expedition to the High Arctic. And, okay. This is this is probably louder. Can you hear from you guys back there? Can you hear Peter? The fellow in the cabin in the back. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, louder. Okay. All right. Not good. Okay. Okay. No. So the bell in the back of the cap, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. All right, well thank you folks. Thank you for the invitation from one chapter to another to speak about my, my trip up to the high Arctic. It's my second trip to the Arctic, and I'll be talking to you later in my presentation about my first trip north of Greenland in uh, 1996. So the National Geographic Expedition was 11 days, and uh, we were accompanied on board by Susan Goldberg, who is the editor-in-chief of National Geographic magazine, and she's also in charge of all their digital platforms. Brilliant woman to have on board, great, great communicator, good person to spend time with, and her husband, Jeffrey. There were 11 National Geographic naturalists on board. There was one National Geographic photographer, a fellow named Jasper from Netherlands. And there was a videographer from uh, National Geographic, a fellow named Steve from Portland, Oregon. So where did we go? I'm going to point to the screen here a little bit. So we were in Svalbard. And Svalbard is halfway between Norway and the North Pole. So. Svalbard is an archipelago. It's a series of islands out in the ocean. So, it's, uh, the west coast of Svalbard stays pretty warm because the Gulf Current floods it in the wintertime. It stays warm on the east side. So Svalbard is part of the Kingdom of Norway. The largest island in Svalbard is Spitsberg, which is here on the left. And then in Spitsburg, in the largest community is a town named Long Yearbin, and that's where our charter flight from Oslo took us. So Spitsburg was named in 1596 by William Barents. He was a Dutch explorer, and Spitsburg in, in Flemish means jagged peaks, and you can see that from this photograph. So this is the town of Long Yearbin. And the National Geographic Explorer is the ship that's in the harbor here. It has an ice-reinforced hull so it can travel through the Arctic waters, and it actually travels the Antarctic waters as well. After this expedition, it sails south to, to the, the southern hemisphere for another expedition down there. Maximum speed, 15 knots, has 11 heavy-duty Zodiacs on board, which we used a great deal during our trip. So the expedition traveled north of 82 degrees of latitude. We were about 450 miles south of the North Pole, which is at 90 degrees of latitude. And here where we are, we're about 43 degrees of latitude, so we're kind of halfway between the equator and the North Pole here. During the exped expedition, we watched for polar bears, walrus, arctic fox, seals, reindeer, pelagic birds, dolphins, and whales. We began our, our journey in Svalbard, specifically in Longyearbyen. Svalbard is above the Arctic Circle, 
78 degrees of latitude, has continuous sun from the middle of April to the middle of August. 98% of the land in Svalbard is protected. It's an Arctic desert, and the early explorers from Britain, Holland, Norway, and Russia were there as fur trappers, and also they began whaling operations there. The northern lights are visible during the winter months, and in the summer, they have the midnight sun, which we experienced. We never had any, uh, any darkness during our trip in late April, so the sun was shining for 24 hours a day. In Svalbard, the mean temperature is five degrees above zero in the wintertime in February. In the summer, it warms up to 45 degrees, so not a really warm place to be. In the expedition, our temperature averaged about 32 degrees, plus or minus a few degrees. It was fairly warm for April. And the water temperature in the Arctic at that point was 29 degrees. The tidal change is only about one meter, not three feet. The uh, topography seems to dampen the, uh, the high and the low tides up there. There's a short growing season, and for anybody who raises anything, you'll like this. June is spring, July is summer, August begins autumn, and September is the beginning of the freezing period. So. So we had 24 hours of, of sunlight. Does anyone want to guess what time of the day I took this picture? What's a guess? Shout something out. 1 a.m., 1.06 a.m. What time did I take this picture? It's the same day. S no, 6 a.m. Five hours difference between blue skies and it looks like Kong Island at one of the movies. <laughs> This is downtown Long Yearly. This is the central business district. From where I'm standing with my camera down to the farthest person you can see on the sidewalk, there's like a group of four or five across way in the back there. That's the extent of the central business district in Long Yearly. The town was established in 1906 by an American named John Longyear from Boston. He came to Svalbard, specifically to Spitsburg, and to uh, develop coal mines. He developed the first of several coal mines while he was there. And Long Year Ben is a Norwegian word. His name is Long Year. They added B-Y-E-N to the end of it. It means open all year. They kind of were cheeky and played with his last name. The settlement has 2,200 residents, permanent residents, and 53% of them, uh, excuse me, 35% of them are non-Norwegians, and they come from 53 countries. But most of them are Swedes and Norwegians. It's, the airport here in Longyearbyen is the farthest place you can fly in the world on a commercial airline. You can't go any farther north than here. About 150,000 tourists a year arrive by the harbor or they arrive by, uh, by air. Longyearbyen has a bank, a post office, a pub, a coffee shop, a Thai restaurant, and yes indeed, a Toyota dealership. <laughs> so you better like a Toyota. So this here is the Stoutard Global Seat Vault. It's not very elegant, and while we were there, it was under construction. The permafrost had melted in prior years. There was a puddle of water inside the entrance to the seat vault. It didn't damage any of the 1.5 million seed deposits that are in there from countries around the world. This is 130 meters above sea level, 100 meters into the mountainside, which is an abandoned coal mine. There's three chambers in there. It's in virgin rock. Uh, the chambers are kept at a constant temperature, which is around 38 degrees. It is, there's a coal mine that is still operational in Long Yearman that uh, provides coal to the power plant that heats this. And if there's any kind of failure in the plant, the power plant's equipped with generators to run on, on diesel fuel so that the temperatures stay constant in this. Even though it's buried in the permafrost, they, they, they control the the atmosphere within in the sea wall. This here is our first polar bear encounter. Of course, he was painted on the side of the building next to a parking lot. But polar bears are endangered. They've been protected by the Kingdom of Norway since 1973, and they're no longer hunted. This here is the University Center of Svalbard. It has undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate degrees that uh, most of them relate to topics from the Arctic. They have a one-year Arctic guide program, which most of the naturalists, scientists on the National Geographic Expedition uh, had taken. They were graduates of the program. 
It's a home of the Stalmar Museum, which is this right side of the building here is a museum. And the Northern Lights Observatory is housed there. And the, the Norwegian Polar Institute is there as well. So as a college town, they have college housing. And probably to the dream of every mayor in America, or maybe every country, they are able to isolate the college students way out at the end, of, <laughs> end of a dead-end road. And the kids are out there, and they've got to walk 10 or 15 minutes to get to their, their, uh, their classes. So they're, they're all out there. And Svalbard, administratively, they control the, uh, the color palette, the design of the buildings, the height and the architecture. So it's a, a really a homogeneous looking community. And these are some of the, the residential housings here. But more importantly, if you look at, to the right of the picture, you see that tall tower there. That's part of the old coal transport system that dotted this end of um, Spitsbergen Island. There are hundreds of these towers that are now abandoned. Put buckets of coal on uh, cable cars and run back and forth from the seven different coal mines that were once operating. And they would feed down into the harbor and they would dump the coal there to the power plant and also ship some out for commercial sale. There are more snowmobiles in Stalbar than there are people. So uh, 2,200 people, several thousand more snowmobiles. It's a way of life. And a cemetery. It's now illegal to die in Svalbard. The cemetery was emptied out a few years ago. All of the coffins were removed to the mainland because the permafrost is melting and the coffins are starting to rise out of the permafrost. So in a person's final days, they go down to the Norwegian mainland to, uh, to spend their final days. So this is a, a child's playground. But you know, we see playgrounds, we see fences around them. But the photograph I didn't get was the, photo, was the playground with concertina wire and electrified fencing because of the polar bears. So the kids get to play outside. There are two playgrounds in town, but they're guarded with a civilian who is licensed to carry a long gun to protect the students and the teachers, of course, from polar bears. So to shoot a polar bear in Norway, you better have a good reason. If a bear is any closer than 30 meters, about 100 feet, you need to discharge at least 30 flares before you can fire your rifle. So the flares typically will scare the polar bears away. If you do discharge your rifle and you kill a bear, you better have a reasonable and, ex and uh, an acceptable explanation for the authorities because they're going to grill you about killing an endangered species. And that happened in, in early 2019. And somebody had a difficult time explaining as to why they killed a polar bear to the Norwegian authorities. William Barents explored the area in 1596, and he overwintered that year. And this is a replica of his cabin. It's been turned into a welcome center, and it was really welcoming when we were there. But the best part was this. They made homemade waffles for us. And you either slathered on brown Norwegian cheese, or you covered them up with strawberry jam and butter. I took, I took the jam and the butter. They also had black coffee or chilled black currant juice. So waffles and strawberry jam and black currant juice was a good choice. I can say that. Really good choice. So sled dogs. Dog sledding is very popular on Spitsbergen, especially here in Long, Long Yearman. It's the biggest of the communities. So ski drawing is huge, where dogs will pull somebody on skis. But you don't go backcountry, which is just the other side of the road here in, in Long Yearman, unless you have someone with a, a license carrying a long gun. Same with your snowmobiles. You need to protect yourself from polar bears because they are everywhere and they are apex predators. So we heard a whole lot about Santa's home when we were on the island and we didn't quite understand what we were being told. This is the site of an abandoned coal mine and there's a fellow who lived here by himself and in the wintertime he kept the lights on. Who wouldn't? But the children in, in, uh, in Long Yearbin came to believe it was Santa's home. And that's what this is called. This is where Santa lives, because if, at nighttime, Santa's lights are on, and that must be where he lives, if there's a side of the mountain and out of town. We thought that was pretty cool. The sun comes up in early March, and there's an eight-day festival to end the dark season after months of, of 24 hours of darkness. And after the sun comes up in March, it's just, that's when sightings begin for both birds and reindeer. So this is our route. We started off in Lungierman, here, 
We came out, we explored these fjords. That's where I took that picture at one o'clock in the morning our first night. We came up along the western coast, came down here to these fjords, and then back over here, and then we ended up way up here at the end of our trip where we hit 82 degrees of latitude, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So we traveled 1,350 nautical miles within the Greenland Sea, the Norwegian Sea, the Barents Sea, and the Arctic Ocean. We hit all four bodies of water. This is the expedition flag with polar bears on it, and I believe the one from the South Pole has penguins. So we departed our, our trip of the region by ship. We were on Zodiacs, our little floating boats, and also by walking on land. So the Arctic up here is really a desert. Whatever nutrients you are, they're minimal in terms of supporting any kind of vegetation. The fertilizer that comes comes from the birds that live in colonies and their, their guano comes down or it's discharged in flight and it creates opportunities for plants to grow. This was taken on our first night at sea. This is a man walking along the shore on permafrost and that's where he lives. The peaks behind them, the ones in, that we saw earlier, they're 3,000 feet or a little bit more. They're not quite a high peak, but the jagged peaks in Salvador are at least 3,000 feet. You can see from the size of this man walking on the beach and what's behind him. And we're only looking maybe half of that, that mountain behind him. This is an abandoned Russian mining camp, excuse me, Russian coal mining operation that closed in 1998. There's a couple who live there now so that the Russian government can retain ownership of it, and they run an Airbnb. <laughs> now, we, we saw a video of the inside of the Airbnb, let me tell you. <laughs> they couldn't pay you to stay there. <laughs> you needed rubber boots to walk inside because there was standing water everywhere. I can believe the mold and the cold was just brutal, but like, you could stay in a Russian mining camp <laughs> in, uh, in Svalbard, if you want, and pay about 100 euros a night to do that. No thank you. This is an old hunting, <coughs> excuse me, trapper's cabin for, for the, the men and women who hunted polar bears. This was high up on a cliff. We're in a zodiac here. I shot this, I cropped the bottom of the picture out to pull this in. It's probably 150 feet above the water. But behind him is a mountain and a lot of slopes that come down. And there was one part of the slope that fed down to the water, which I presume would be frozen in the middle of the winter. The bear would be walking down to go out looking for seals, their primary food choice. So, start our conversation of Arctic birds and then marine mammals and then terrestrial mammals. And this begins our Arctic birds. So, there's 36 species of breeding birds on Svalbard. During the expedition, we saw 17 of the 36, and I have photographs of 11. A couple of them, I just didn't think the photograph because I was so excited to see them. So these are in alphabetical order. So these are Atlantic puffins, and these are our barnacle geese. And if you notice something, I'm the king of getting butt shots of birds. <laughs> and notice how those, those barnacle geese camouflaged against those rocks. And we'll see another picture in a few minutes of an arctic fox chasing some, some, uh, some barnacle geese. We're coming in here early one morning about six o'clock to these cliffs. And this looks like a sight out of Alfred Hitchcock movie to me, the birds. And these are Brunix guillemots, or thick-billed muir, muirs. And they're high up on the cliffs, and you notice they're kind of facing away from the water, they're facing away from the camera, and they've got these very stiff tail feathers. The, the cliffs are so narrow that they turned around when they were incubating their eggs. There was a good chance that the egg would roll off the cliff and or the chick would take a tumble down the cliff to their demise. So these birds are all facing the cliff and they're looking over the shoulder at these interlopers that are coming in on this great big boat. A few more Brunix guillemots and a few more Brunex guillemots. The, the naturalist on board estimated there were 200,000 pairs of guillemots here, and we saw a lot of them during our travels. It was an amazing sight to see. And just as far as your eyes could take you out to the horizon, there were these rafts of birds floating. And if they weren't floating, they were in the air. If they weren't in the air, they were plastered against the wall of the, the cliffs. This is a great skua. 
In the States here in North America, we call them Jaegers. It has a 55-inch wingspan, and that's when taking off. In the uncropped original picture of this, there's 28 puddles under the bird's feet before he was airborne. It was really cool to see. This was taken about 8.30 at night. The bird was in front of the, the bow of the ship, and as the ship turned, we spooked him, and he went to the air, and I got a couple of shots. It was really cool to see this, but here his feet tapping the water as he's trying to take off. These are King Eider ducks. There's a flock of those. Sometimes we saw them floating by our, our zodiacs as we're in the water being transported from ship to shore. This particular day, they were in an inland pond. These are some kittiwakes, um, a mated pair sitting on an iceberg. These are long-tailed ducks and uh, cherry old squaws, do I have that right? Yes. These used to be called oats and old squaws, and now they're called uh, long-tailed ducks. And I've never seen them before, and you can spot a long-tailed duck a mile away. These are purple sandpipers, and that arc in the middle is not a, not a croquet coop. It's just, uh, it's just a piece of kelp that's there. These are tracks from a rock ptarmigan, which we did not see, but we saw the tracks on one of the islands we were on, the Reindeer Plateau. So birds, for you birders out there, we did see these birds that don't have pictures. Black guillemots, common eiders, ivory gulls, long northern fulmers, pink-footed geese, and snow buntings. Snow buntings are the only slot bird that is native to Svalbard. And there are snowy owls up there. I thought I saw snowy and I photographed them in the winter down near Lake George and Fort Edward where I live and I was really excited. It wasn't a snowy, it was a gull. It was really hot. <laughs> it's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to come home saying I saw snowy in the Arctic. It didn't work. So, let's talk about our, our terrestrial mammals at this point. So I came across this and uh, we were walking, walking from the ship up this slope, making a left turn, another turn, making a big square circle. As we came up, before we made our first left turn to the nine o'clock position, I smelled basically cow poop. I'm like, I don't understand. Two guys I'm hiking with, you smell anything? Nothing, okay. Two minutes later, I saw this pile of droppings. So, okay, who's the critter? Okay, then we came across this print. Okay, what's this? I look for tracks in the snow in the wintertime. I've never seen anything like this before. Then one of our naturalists found that. Okay, do we have white-tailed deer in Svalbard? We're up here, we're hundreds of miles north of uh, mainland. But we've got reindeer, okay? It's a Svalbard reindeer that we have. And one grazing here, and here we call them caribou. This here is an arctic fox in the white phase. And up here, I defy you to tell me where the two barnacle geese are, because I can't find them. They're in there. Shortly after I took this picture, he rushed forward to his left, like towards the 10 o'clock position, and the two geese flew towards us, well, kind of away to the left. He flushed them out, but we could not see them. We didn't know what he was looking at as we was in our zodiacs, eyeballing this fox. And behind him to the right is a, a whole herd of reindeer. They totally, he totally ignored them, they ignored him. They're like, eh, it's just a fox, you know. So at, at this point, we start um, our on-foot tour of the Arctic tundra and permafrost. And these zodiacs are being offloaded from our ship. And um, I've never been in a zodiac before, especially in these kind of temperatures. So it was kind of interesting. I was a little nervous, but it turned out to be a very easy transition. Because we're in the high Arctic and there's a real concern about contamination of bringing in invasive species, the, tour, the cruise operators up there have signed some biosecurity guidelines for Arctic expeditions. So before we entered the Zodiac, before we entered this room, we had to walk through an entrance with this basin that had a disinfectant in it. One, our boots had to be scrubbed before we got on board the ship. We had to scrub them at home to get rid of the dirt that we might bring from home. We walked into the disinfectant, and then we stepped into this room with these jets of water. We had to stand there and scrub our boots front and back on the grating, and then to rinse with this water. And then we dropped down a staircase and entered the zodiac so that we're not bringing any contamination, any invasive species into the Arctic. And when we returned, we had to repeat the process so that we're not bringing anything from the Arctic back home to the States or whatever country that we're coming in. 
I was really impressed by that because I, I do some work as a master gardener with invasive species control. That was, that was important. So these are the zodiacs that, uh, that transport us to shore with some of my, my shipmates here. When we get on shore, this is what we're greeted with. We have our, 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 our guides who are naturalists and they're licensed by the Kingdom of Norway to carry a long gun to protect us from polar bears. Only once was there a potential sighting when we were on land and we were all collected until it was an all clear and it turned out just to be a big hunk of ice that had fallen off a cliff until it was investigated. But they, they took a lot of precautions to protect us from any, any danger. So this here is just a shot of a, a bunch of rocks. But I'm told by one of the naturalists on board the ship that this is a geologist's dream, that igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks were all deposited in this one, one view of rocks on the, on the shore of, uh, of Reindeer Plateau, where we were. So uh, I guess if I was a geologist, that would really make me happy. I just thought they were pretty. So plants are opportun opportunistic up here in the Arctic because it's so dry. There's nutrient-poor soils. And to our right was a small slope that drained down into this this rocky shore here. And we're probably 300 feet from the water line. And these are, this is a moss campion that's growing here. It might have been an inch, an inch and a half high, and went on for several hundred feet, but it was getting fresh water from the right versus the seawater that's out in front there. It was growing and it was coming back to life. We're there in the third week of May. Spring is just beginning to appear in the high Arctic. So this is Patrick fella in the sweater here, the Icelandic sweater, and he's holding some trash, which is a, a fishing net. And so every time we walked on land, we saw trash, we saw garbage, and we're 400 miles from the, from the North Pole. It was kind of depressing to see the garbage, but it was there. When you hear about plastic in the water, it's in the Arctic. It's not just in the beaches along the Jersey Shore or Long Island. What's also interesting about this picture, Ireland, Australia, Australia. Brian Barber is an American citizen who lives around Washington, he lives in Washington, and he spends half a year, he's a clinical psychologist, he has a PhD in clinical psychology, he spends half a year in Gaza working with at-risk children due to the, the living conditions there. Fascinating man, I guess he's well published in his field, but uh, there's kind of the range of folks that were aboard ship. This was interesting. Uh, again, we're on Ranger Plateau, and these logs here, they're larches and pines that floated a thousand miles down from Siberia from logging operations. And the Arctic storms in the winter washed them on, sh on shore. We're probably four or five hundred feet from the water's edge. So the storms, when they come, good heavens, I would not want to be there. I'm not sure. It, it would be a pretty scene. There were just thousands of these logs in this one stretch of the ocean edge of the ocean. More trash and barrels went down forever. And this, this rise here was probably 20 feet over our head from where we were standing back here. It rose up, and so that barrel, that barrel had a long ride to get up there. This is a group of my shipmates uh, before we started taking a hike on, on um, Reindeer Plateau. If you notice the color of the dirt here, it's red. It's sandstone, it's enriched with, uh, with uh, iron oxide. It's basically rusting. And we're gonna come back to this in a couple minutes. You'll see how it's, it impacts the local environment. And you can see the peaks there. Those are 3,000 foot plus peaks. And wherever you looked, there were these mountains. They were consistent in the height. As, as someone who climbs mountains and high peaks in other places, I keep, keep thinking, has anybody ever climbed this mountain? Probably not. So this picture was taken by a woman on board the ship who's from Hong Kong. And it's one of my favorite pictures, probably because I'm in it. This is me lying on the ground. And this is Steve from uh, Portland, Oregon. He's the videographer for the ship. And this is, this is Brian from, uh, from Washington. So I'm lying there and I'm photographing Arctic flowers. And I have a, a bit of a love for botany. So, so I'm lying here and I'm taking pictures. And Steve lies down next to me and goes, just talk, just tell me what you're taking pictures of. So I was telling him that I know that in the, the, the 11 alpine summits and the high peaks, there's plants there that grow 
in the high Arctic, vice versa. So I wanted to document what I could find. And I did match two plants. I did match, uh, I matched uh, a moss, and uh, I matched two mosses, a reindeer moss and a map moss. And there, uh, we'll come to a picture of one of them in a moment here. Let me see here. So when I got home, I had this red parka on, and I was getting all my gear together, and I couldn't understand why the front of it was just filthy black. Then I remembered I did this. The, the permafrost, the active layer, it's one to two, one to three and a half feet when it starts to melt. We were there in early spring, and it was soft. We all had boots on that were rated to minus 40, although we never hit temperatures that are much colder than the high, plus 20s. And, um, but they were great for getting in and out of the, the zodiacs. This is one of the lichens here. Excuse me, the kind of lichen. This is a map lichen. And I'm not quite sure how it gets a name, but it does. And maybe it's because of all of this here. But there's a matching photograph of one up in the little nature hut in the high peaks up at the lodge. Which, uh, if you look at the picture, you look at this, and I did that with Kayla a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's a pretty good match. It made me smile. And this is a sunburst lichen, and we'll see another one of those. Sunburst like a really brilliant, brilliant orange. It goes from uh, some kind of soft yellows to very vibrant oranges. And this is purple saxifrage in bloom. And that's a great big mound of purple saxifrage in bloom. A few weeks later, this was the first flower that we saw starting to open up. And then they, they turned into kind of a rose petal type uh, blossom when they, they're fully open. And here, you can just see down in the corner here, they're starting to open and flatten out. But they're gorgeous plants. I didn't smell too much of a fragrance from them, but it was pretty early in the season. A few weeks later, we would have seen uh, chickweeds, arctic cotton grass, sand warts, all plants that can be found in the arctic zones, arctic regions up in the high peaks. And this is something I didn't expect to see. Not just a moss campion here, which is this from last year, kind of coming back to life. I didn't expect to see a spider. I mean, a spider in the arctic? Who knew? It's a black house spider. I don't know how it gets its name, but uh, when I looked up Arctic spiders, this is the only one that matched it. So there was a guy. Was Steve, the videographer, was, he was filming me at that point. He actually spotted it. And I have another shot with his finger kind of like pointing into it, but he kind of was hiding it. So I think this is a better shot. This is some sandstone that's just fractured from the freeze thaw cycle, but the Norwegian calls, call it troll bread, which to me looks like troll toast, but it was kind of cool. It was, it was all over the place as we were walking through the plateau. This is one of the, uh, the zodiacs that was used at the, the cliffs where we saw all the, the Brunix guillemots. The dive team was out here and they were diving in the water at 29 degrees. We were below the cliffs with hundreds of thousands of birds and their droppings going into the water. We created quite a, a, a vibrant marine underwater environment. So there were a couple of different dives that the National Geographic scientists took. When they went down here, they found barnacles, crabs, sculpin fish, shrimp, sponges, and starfish. And they, there's, they showed us a brief video that they filmed. And uh, it all came from, from this spot here. Uh, these guys were targets for the birds that were flying over uh, because they liked to discharge their ammunition as they come and exit the shore. And I guess these guys got hammered by the gillmots. <laughs> this was our first encounter with a marine mammal. And we're like, what's that? Is it a seal? What is it? Is it just, is it, is it dirty, dirty snow? It was a juvenile walrus without his tusks, which I'd never seen. And it looked like someone whose dentures had been taken out and their mouth had caved in. He was kind of a funny looking guy. But then we got to see a real walrus with his tusks. And we're going to see lots more of those. So one morning at 6 o'clock, the announcements come on, and you hear, you know, you're sound asleep because you're up late, there's no sunset, and you're enjoying the environment, and you just want to lay in bed, and it's like, there's walrus. Not just one, not just two, but they counted at least 110 walrus in a huddle on shore. Here, this is Moffin Island. Moffin Island has an elevation of about four feet. So I got dressed, I ran out, grabbed my camera, and there was only one other person on the bridge with me that morning which is a woman, and she's standing next to me, and she's like, 
oh, that's really nasty. It smells like a stockyard. I'm like, I don't smell a thing. And she turned away and she went to another part of the ship. As soon as she turned away, it hammered me. Oh my God, these guys are stinky. Absolutely stinky. They had bad toileting habits. You can just see that. You know, they just, you know, the world is theirs. So these walrus are mature. They run about 2,200 pounds apiece. And the five of these went single file from a higher point on the island down to the beach, one at a time. They would raise up, they would drop down and kind of wiggle. Raise up, drop down and kind of wiggle. And I, I bet you anything, if I was on shore and they were doing that, even one at a time, I would have, heard, would have felt the earth shake because they were so massive. It would take two times and you're just slamming it on the beach and kind of rolling forward. It was, it was quite a sight to see and smell. And this is a different location. We came across a fair number of walrus. I was hoping to see a walrus, and uh, when I asked one of the, the guides if we would, he's like, oh yeah, I guarantee you we're going to see a walrus, and he was right. And more of them. This shot here, there are actually five walrus, walrus but there's a little fella here that kept poking his head up and down like a, like a pogo stick. He just kept disappearing on us, so I gave up on taking his picture. And this is one of my favorite pictures of an encounter that we came across. It's a bearded seal, it's a female. We know it's a female because her pup was on another part of the bay. We're in our zodiac here. And you look at her red face, and this is her natural color here. And you look at her red face. Well, back on that little plateau where the people were standing with the sandstone that had turned to red with the iron oxide, well, this is a glacial bay. The glacier's grinding the sandstone into a powder. It's flushing it into the bay. The sandstone's settling down to the bottom. And these are benthic feeders. So when she's eating, she's taking her head and she's doing this on the bottom, digging for mollusks with her face. And the iron oxide is staining her fur. I just think that's really cool. It's just, that's neat. And her little pup was there, very entertaining to people in another zodiac, wanting to climb aboard, probably for some hot chocolate or something. So we were on board the ship and we were, we were taught to look for fuzzy yellow things, not white things. Look for fuzzy yellow things, which are the polar bears. They really aren't white, they really are yellow white. And so this was the, the first encounter that we had that was this close with the bears. We had others that were closer. These are brunette guillemots flying in front of the bear. They appear a lot closer to him. They, they appear like they're around his head, but he's several hundred feet past them. I'm using a 900 millimeter lens here, so I'm, I'm pulling in the, the composition really hard. So the bears are, this guy's walking on a glacial lateral moraine. He's the king of the Arctic. He's the world's largest predator. He's been protected in Norway since 1973. The Arctic conditions access, limit his access to food for six to eight months at a time. These adult males can weigh 1,800 pounds. They don't hibernate, but the females do. The females dig dens deep into the slopes of those, those 3,000 foot peaks to give birth to their young. Their milk fat, or their milk has 30 to 40 percent fat content. So those kids are getting raised on some really rich milk. Bears can reach 30 years of age. They prefer to eat seals, but they will eat a weakened reindeer or a walrus or a dead whale. It's all fair game to them. They can travel several thousand miles a year in between Svalbard and the Russian territory to the east, Franz Joseph Land, there's an estimate, estimation of 1,900 to 3,600 bears. And male bears that have been banded have a yellow tag in their right ear. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of a bear with a tag in his right ear. So this guy just, he just was walking along and he just parked himself down. He laid down, rested his chin for all the 15 or 20 seconds and got, got up again. We thought he was going to pop into the water and just swim away, but he just did this, got up and went looking for food. So check out the size of his right paw there, his right front paw. Just look at the size of that. What amazes me, I've seen a lot of Inuit art, whether I've been in Labrador or Newfoundland or Greenland or Alaska, Norway. The Inuits don't have cameras, but the stonework that I've seen in their carvings, they, they capture these postures of the bears perfectly from memory. Absolutely, absolutely perfectly. It's just I find it astounding. 
just massive guys. And they have poor eyesight, but they have great olfactory senses. Their nose is terrific. They can smell miles away. And look at, this, look at the size of his paw there, the size of this. I mean, would you want him to take a swipe at you? I don't think so. And then this guy got in the water and he just went for a ride. So these here, I have a series of eight pictures here, which I'll repeat a couple times. But the captain of our ship had been in the Arctic for 30 years. He had never seen a polar bear attack walrus before. And this particular day we did. So this lone bear, I don't know if it's male or female, I assume without cubs, they assumed it had got cups, it was a male. So just watch the bear's posture, watch the walrus defend themselves. Okay, this is for his last charge. Then he goes in, and then he says, you know what, I think tonight I'm gonna go out to dinner. I'm not gonna have a walrus. That night aboard ship, when they kind of do a roundup of the day's events, one of the New Geographic's National showed us a photograph of a polar bear that had been speared by a walrus. And he had a hole in the, his backside that had to be about three inches across, really bloody and nasty. These guys know better than to get too, too close to a healthy, vibrant uh, walrus because they can do some real damage. They can kill the bear. So just to go back, so just watch the postures of the bear and the walrus. And that took all of about 10 seconds to do that. So after the bear disappeared, the boat was able to float past where he had walked. And I was able to shoot this photograph down from the bridge onto, onto the ice. And just the size of his, his paws and whatnot, the imprint there, it's incredibly impressive. And this here is a plastic model that was in the library uh, for the the National Geographic Explorer of, of a bear's head. They have 42 teeth. And I would say that these four teeth alone would do anything that those other teeth couldn't do. So here we'll start talking uh, briefly about whales and dolphins. There was an Arctic storm next door last night, and I got fairly seasick from it, even though I was in my, my bunk. In the, so I didn't go out on deck right away, and I hear on the loudspeaker, oh, there's a pod of white-beaked dolphins. There's 30 white-beaked dolphins. Wait, 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 there's thin back whales. There's thin whales. I'm like, okay, I guess I can get out on the deck. I didn't even bring my camera, and that for me is rare, very rare. So we get out on deck, the, the, um, the dolphins ate for a few minutes, and they kind of disappeared, but the thin back whales stayed there for probably 15 or 20 minutes feeding in front of us. They're 50-ton baleen whales. They're 70 feet long, and there was at least 10 of them that we could count. The ship pretty much was an idol, and the, the whales would dive to feed, and they would, once they sounded, they came up, and they blew out their, their blowholes. There'd be this big foaming froth of water that just boiled in front of the ship. When it did, the, the gulls just came in the hundreds to eat the little parcels of food that the whales hadn't consumed. It went on and on and on, cycle after cycle. It was really something to see. And it was stinky. It smelled like a fish market. It's, it was, it, the whales were eating a lot, of, a lot of krill, a lot of plankton, whatever else they were, they were getting down their gullets. Um, it, it was stinky. This day here, we had a choice of going kayaking in a glacial day or hiking. I'd love to do both, but figuring, when am I going to be on land in the Arctic again? I was already aboard a ship. So I went for a hike, and that's the day that I was able to take photographs of all the wildflowers, at least the ones that I could see. So in 1996, I was a guest of the Air Force, and I was invited to participate in Cool School. That's K-O-O-L, Cool School. People in the Air Force have to be certified for cold weather survival every few years, and the Air Force has a training program in the Arctic, but most of their work is done in the Antarctic. They supply McMurdo Bay and the National Science Foundation scientists down at the South Pole. But the program is run, it was run the year I did, it was run in Greenland, now it's run off of Barrow, Alaska. So there were 27 people in the school. There were three instructors from Lyleson Air Force Base in Alaska. There were five civilians, including myself and someone else on 
Lower Adirondack Search and Rescue Team that I'm part of. So we got to go to Cool School. There's a female photographer from the Schenectady Gazette. There's a congressman from someplace in New York State, I don't remember where, I, th I think downstate. And there is a, a photographer from San Antonio, Texas, who was part of the Air Force, but he was kind of there as a civilian guest to take pictures and create a documentary. So I went to cool school. So we flew from Stewart, excuse me, from um, Scotia Air Base, outside of Schenectady. They flew us to Frobisher in the Northwest Territory of Canada, which is now Qualiwit. It changed, the province changed maybe 15 years ago or so. And then we, we flew on to Tule, Greenland. We had a day of Arctic survival training at Scotia Air Base, another day at Thule, then they flew us on a C-130 transport, which had skis on the bottom of it. They flew us about four hours to the polar ice cap, north of the northeastern corner of Greenland. We were a couple hundred miles, about 450 miles south of the geographic North Pole. In 1996, I was at 82 degrees of latitude in 50 minutes, 82.50. When we landed at 12.30 in the afternoon, the air temperature was minus 55 degrees, and then it got colder. Okay. We, 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 we had to build our own shelters, so we, we cut the ice cap at that point, was between eight and nine feet thick, and we used these little hand saws. We cut out blocks, made a big column about the size of a freezer, draped over a parachute, weighted it down with more ice blocks, and dug into it, and we slept in our minus 70 sleeping bags underneath the shelter, ambient temperature, okay? as a wind block. So, so we did that. Now, we were there, I was there just a big guest, probably the neatest thing I've ever done in my life. It was just phenomenal. So fast forward to this trip to the Arctic here. And so I did that in the third week of April, 1996. Minus 55 to minus 70, nine feet of ice in the ice cap. The National Geographic expedition took us to 82 degrees of latitude in eight minutes. 82.08 versus 82.50. We were virtually the exact same latitude, 20 years apart by coincidence, about 450 to 500 miles east of where I was off the coast of Greenland. So the world had changed a lot. The temperature, the most, the coldest we saw in the 11 days at sea was 28 degrees above zero versus minus 70 below zero. The thickest ice that we saw was three feet thick, the ice cap, the, the pack ice. So the ship that we were on, we went so far north to 82 degrees, and the, the ship captain's 30 years, he'd never gone that far north in May. He had only taken, he always had taken him to June to get that far north. So the world is changing. So when I was on at cool school, I had some incredible experiences at those temperatures. The silence was something that I've never experienced except in caving. If you've ever gone caving, you're at the bottom of the cave, except for water dripping, there's no noise, absolutely none. We were warned about motion sickness when we were being trained, that once we came home, we could become motion sickness because of the stillness on the ice cap. And we all blew it off as like, that's never gonna happen. A few days after I got home, I'm sitting in my room and there's white pine trees outside my window and they're doing this back and forth. I'm sitting there and I'm nauseous to the point where I'm going to get sick. I called my buddy Joe, who was my survival partner. Joe, Joe, I'm going to barf. He goes, me too. We both got hit with motion sickness about three days after we came back from the Arctic. Something that's hard to explain. I didn't believe it could happen and it did. But the neatest thing that happened to me on the first trip on the second night, we had to dig our, our, our shelters down into the ice cap. We're about two feet above the Arctic Ocean. We're essentially in an acoustical chamber. The opening to our, our little snow cave, our ice cave that we built, is sealed with blocks of ice. So we're, we're blocking ourselves in. I had gone north hoping to see beluga whales. Beluga whales, beluga whales, beluga whales. Well, ice cap was frozen solid. We didn't see any whales. But that second night, I had a dream that I heard whales singing. So in the morning, I'm talking to Coach about it, and I'm telling, telling him about it, and one of the Air Force personnel goes, I heard it too, I heard it too. We had a pot of whales swim, swim beneath our survival camp, and being these little acoustical chambers, the song just resonated through our whole bodies and our minds during the night. It's the neatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It was beautiful. 
that was experienced. That's part of the awe and the beauty of the ice cap in 1996. There were snow doubles, there were Arctic mirages, and it was, it was quite an experience. So, I guess I should have been forwarding my slides here. So we were, here is Svalbard. We were here off the northeast coast of Greenland here, and this is about 82 degrees in here. So I was in this range here in terms of those two trips. That is Ice Station Ruby. That, that iceberg is about 200 feet high. It's a quarter mile long and a couple hundred feet wide. That is the leeward side of it. That is the windward side of it. We, were, we camped on this side of it. It blocked the wind for us. It, it protected us. We had a signaling exercise there. We, were, we had military orders to civilians. We had to do some signaling exercises from the top of the iceberg with some mirrors to see if we could hit a target a mile away. The chest of one of the uh, other Air Force personnel, we did that. Estimated wind chill on top of that was minus 200 degrees. As short as I am, I stood in a circle of men and they protected me with their bodies. <laughs> it was great. These are pressure, pressure ridges, and they're about 15 feet high, and we had our, our winter, winter gear on, of course, and there's kind of no max of slippery fabric, so we did a whole lot of butt slidings down these things, which was just plain fun, like five-year-old kids. This is 2018, so you're looking at ice here, that was one of the icebergs on nine feet of ice in 1996. This is last year. You're looking at three feet of ice. We're about 500 miles east and maybe four weeks later in the calendar year. From late April to late May, the world is changing. So climate change is complex. And global warming is one type of that. You know, it's, it's temperature shift, rainfall patterns change, snowfall patterns change, the ocean becomes more acidic, coral reefs die, the warming ocean waters push fish, fish stocks farther north, and companies have to spend more time and more money chasing the fish so we can eat whatever it is that we'd like to eat. So a glacial bay here. This glacier was calving, not only visibly, but we could hear it groaning and moving, it was dropping sheets of ice down into the water. You can see all, all these pieces that are just floating past our zodiac here. If you look at the bottom right of the picture here, you can see where the glacier is starting to recede, which is in here. And now this bay, apparently the geographic expeditions go to this bay every year. And the ship's captain told us that he's several thousand feet farther into the bay than he was even five years ago because so much of the ice is melting. This here is, is part of the exposure of the, uh, the rocks are becoming more visible, the, the snow is pulling back, the ice is melting. And then we came across this, this beautiful arch of snow and ice. And one of the geographic uh, scientists estimated that the, those rocks and this slide, this slide and this slide, they had to see sunlight 40,000 years, which is amazing. Back here to Svalbard, I pulled some statistics out about the changing of climate in Svalbard because it's, it seems to be where the most research is being done on the Arctic with the population there in the university. So you can see our ship in the harbor again, uh, the, the coal plant with the small stack there. So these are observations from the Norwegian Center for Climate Changes and also from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, part of the UN, kind of a global clearinghouse for information on climate change. This is observed in the Arctic. Between 1972 and 2017, in just 45 years, the annual temperature in the Arctic has risen 7.2 degrees. The wintertime temperatures in the Arctic have raised 13.1 degrees. And the global temperature of where we are, it's raised 1.5 degrees. Observed at the Salard Airport, 241 days of frost. Projected by the end of the century, less than 100. The winter's warming four to five times faster than it is in summer, and Svalbard has already lost two months of winter in the last 45 years. Since 1979, Arctic sea ice extent has declined by 12% per decade. So why is sea ice retreating? Well, it's a combination of global warming and the, the, the impact of melting from the warm seawater below. The ocean temperatures are rising. 
and it's coming up from the, the Gulf Stream and hitting the west coast of uh, Svalbard and, and other parts of the Arctic. There's heavier rainfalls in the winter instead of snow, and the rain is causing problems, especially for the reindeer. You might have read last week or the week before that rain, Santa's reindeer are starving, but well, they were talking about the reindeer on Svalbard. With the rain, the rain will hit, it will get cold, it will freeze, and it creates a cap on top of the vegetation that the reindeer used to be able to kind of paw through the snow in the wintertime and pull up the mosses and other vegetation that they eat. But now with this layer of ice, they can't get through it. It's not part of their, not part of, it's never part of their world. So just to conclude with some, so, some, some final thoughts. So what do we do? The Secretary General of the, the UN, Antonio Gutierrez, said in recent weeks that there's still hope that the governments need to act politically bold to help si solve some of the climate change problems. Reading about this, especially some information from the United, the United Nations, I came across quote from the French author Antoine de saint exupery in his 1948 work called The Citadel. You might remember he wrote The Little Prince. He wrote, as for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but it's to enable it. So the world is a beautiful place filled with plants, animals, geology, and places that take our breath away. For me, it's the colder climes. In my opinion, it's our task to protect and preserve the earth for our grandchildren and their grandchildren so one day they too can walk on the polar ice cap or sleep on the polar ice cap in an ice cave and hear whales sing beneath their, their little acoustical chamber. Thank you. search and rescue team uh, based out of Warrensburg, just above Lake George Village. One of our new team members was a member of the 109th Airlift Wing out of Scotia, the Stratton Air Base. And we did a lot of cross-training of mock searches between the search team and the Air Force personnel. And what we didn't know is that Paul was, was assessing winter survival skills for a couple of us as we trained in the winter. So he invited two of us to go to cool school. He happened to be the person who ran the program, so he could invite some civilian guests. Pure luck. The second trip, I had planned to go to Churchill, Manitoba, to see the polar bears. So I called them, I got my reservation, and I said, I need to call you back, give me a couple hours, make sure I can fly there from the Albany Airport. When I called back, they sold my slot. I was really angry. So I get online, and I'm banging on my computer, where can I go photograph polar bears? And the National Geographic Expedition came up. I booked it. So it was just by chance that, and I ended up in the same latitude to have that comparison polar ice cap from 96 to 2018 were exactly the 80, 82 degrees of latitude. That's how it happened, just by chance. Other questions? If not, folks, thanks so much. I enjoy talking. Oh, wait a minute, come back here. Yes, yeah, so if you would go back to that slide of the uh, town, I noticed some of those boats in the foreground have maps. They look like they're just sailing boats. They are sailboats. We, we saw a couple of sailboats go by us. This is April up in the high Arctic, and these are these little sailboats with you know a couple of people on board, and they just turn around these bays. And we were hundreds of miles north of Longyearbyen, where there's civilization. This is where there's more snowmobiles than people. And we were we were probably two days north of it cruising, and yet we saw people just tooling around in their sailboats. It was a, I was impressed. They're hardcore. Well, thank you very much.